Okay, good afternoon. So glad you are here. Each one of you is precious that's in the audience, so I'm glad you're here. I'm Jane Dutton. I'm one of the co-founders of the Center for Positive Organizations, and I'm also the person who has organized the PosLink series this year. For those of you who are new, welcome. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, for those of you who are just getting familiar with the Center for Positive Organizations, we have been in existence for about 13 years. We are the place for research on how to, to design organizations so that they bring out the best in people. And we serve our constituencies, our, uh, we serve researchers globally who are trying to uh, add value to this positive organizational scholarship movement. We also serve as companies and clients who are interested in the, in the services and the knowledge that's coming out of the research. And importantly, we also serve students. We have courses that are designed um, that have what we call POS on the inside. So it's a, um, a research center that has lots of activity going on in it. One of the really important activities is what is this Positive Links series. And uh, this year, which is new, um, we've decided to sort of organize it around a book. And so in some sense, you can think about um, this, this series this year as a way to give you the, some of the best hits that are in this uh, book on how, on how to be a positive leadership leader. Um, it's called Small Actions and Big Impact. And what's so exciting about the book, Gretchen Spreiser and I as editors had the opportunity to design a set of researchers to sort of make their best contribution about what a positive leader could do, again, to, uh, to uh, expand the capacity for excellence in their organization. And throughout the year, we're going to give you sort of different samplings of um, sort of the best practices that come out of the book. So uh, we hope that it will whet your appetite for buying the book. We actually have a, a Positive Links book, book selling section sort of outside of, of uh, this session that after the series, um, if we do whet your appetite, you could buy that book as well as others. And we're also going to have refreshments for you at the, at the end of this session. Um, this session is being live streamed. Uh, and for those of you who know people that would be interested in listening to Dave's talk, um, and they couldn't be here, just know that you can access the video from his talk um, on our website. And you can also see on our website, again, past years of great Positive Links talks and listen to and hear about what the series will have um, coming forth. Um, however, I'd like to just invite you, because we're trying in some ways to build community, if you haven't introduced yourself to the person next to you, just take a minute, um, if you could, to just introduce yourself and, and maybe just say one thing about why you're here. So I'm going to give you just a minute to do that. David and I were at Medication Western Okay. <laughs> so now we'll, um, now that you're a little bit more connected than you were a minute ago, um, let me also just um, take this moment to, uh, to thank Diane and Paul Jones, who have been the sponsors of the Positive Link series for many years. We could not have done this without you, um, and we're really glad that you travel each Positive Link session from the west side of the state to Ann Arbor to be here. So um, please uh, join me in thanking them for their support. So now it's my time to introduce my wonderful colleague, Dave Mayer, and I want to, I'm not going to do too long of an introduction, but I just have to give you some, some formal facts and some informal facts about Dave. He has his uh, PhD from University of Maryland. We were really fortunate to have him join us on the faculty here in 2009. Um, he is well known for research in three different areas on behavioral ethics, justice, and workplace diversity. He is a prolific researcher. 
um, over 50 articles. If you know how long he's been, had his PhD, that's quite an accomplishment. But the wonderful thing about Dave is he's also an awesome teacher. And he's one of these people, you'll get a little bit of a sense of it when he gives a talk, who excels in teaching across the full spectrum of what you're asked to do in a business school. So undergraduates, MBAs, and executives. And he also does um, some powerful consulting. Um, it's important that you know that he was nominated for the Golden Apple Award last year. That's just one signal of the, um, of the excellence of his teaching, and I think we're really um, glad to have him here. Okay, that's the formal stuff. Now let me give you a couple of informal things. He is the nicest guy in the world. He has the proud dad of two adorable um, children, Avery and Caleb. And when uh, Adam Grant was here, he's one of our former students a couple of years ago, he has a popular book called Give and Take. Uh, he talks about people who add value in different ways to organizations. And Dave is a giver, and, and what's really important about that for a, an institution like our Center for Positive Organizations, but also for the Ross School and the university, is he is an institution builder. He is a community builder, and we're, he's also a great writer. So I'm very privileged to, um, to have him as my colleague, and we're privileged to have him lead us off with um, his talk on lead an ethical organization. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> She's going to make me cry before we even start. Thanks, Jane. And you're supposed to set like a lower bar, too. That's the other problem. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me here. This is great. Uh, I know it's a little bit late in the day for a lot of us, so thank you for coming out. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to having a conversation. Sometimes when we're in this big room, it feels like maybe I'm just talking at you, but I will ask a lot of questions, and please do raise your hand, speak up, and we'll, it'll be a little bit more of a conversation. Uh, I also want to start off with an apology, mostly that you've had to look at this mug for a long time on the, uh, Angie sent me the, uh, on our little boards that we have in Ross, and I thought the only thing more obnoxious than that would be if I took a selfie in front of it, <laughs> and just to see what that would be like. Um, but, so my, my apologies there. Um, so who is here? We have a really big mix, and I just want you to know, because it also gears how I would kind of interact with the group. And so most of the folks here are somehow Ross or University of Michigan related. So MBA students, BBA students, alumni, um, some faculty. We have some doctoral students, um, folks from different centers, whether it be from CSI or Social Impact, um, uh, CPO, positive organizations or the Ross Leadership Initiative. We also have some folks from, who work at the university and in in, in Ross in particular in a few different areas. So in development, the library, Marcom, uh, human resources, alumni, exec ed. So we're, I, I put this up and then we have a, a few people from local businesses. So I put that there just so you know. It's one of those uh, types of talks where it's hard to figure out the exact audience. So we're a diverse one. And so our conversation may, you know, It'll, it'll be a little broader than usual. All right, so let me, let me start off with this question and we'll see what you have to say. Uh, when we hear about ethical issues in the news, typically, what are, what are we most likely to hear about? Do we hear about kind of examples of extreme ethical behavior, um, leaders that we see that are uh, great examples, or do we see more kind of corporate scandals and wrongdoing? What is that? Brian, you're saying the, wrong, the wrongdoing. Does anything pop to mind that we've had Recently? Could you guys hear back there? Sorry, we'll have to speak up just a little bit more. We have mics if we need them, but go for it. Say it again, James. Tesco is just the UK supermarket chain has just suspended four of its employees after a $250 million uh, gap in the accounts has been found. Wait, not in the UK. You're supposed to say something good about the UK. <laughs> <laughs> You, yeah. They have you, he left. Yeah. Okay. All right. America. All right. Uh, so yeah, this is a sense to be some of the examples we see. No, I'm not. I just want to highlight this for a second. But we'll see, like in you know, big business of football, right? We have Ray Rice. Does anyone follow this case? So a video came out. What did the video show? Him being really violent towards his then fiance. Um, so that's been in the news a lot. Do you, anyone follow this one? The CEO of Center Plate. Anyone see that? Janet, what did he do? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Did people hear that? So yeah. So he. Man who is that on? Yeah. This is the man who was kicking the dog. I think a puppy, in fact, of a friend of his, and then ended up having to resign because of the furor over it. It was horrible. Yeah. It's like the CEOs do these things that can like hurt all these stakeholders around the world, but once you kick a dog, that is where this is where we draw the line. But yeah, there was. A, there was a video about it, um, and people saw, lost his job. And then we can see, uh, did anyone see in New York the recent, there's a, there was just a, um, uh, a big march, really getting business to try to focus more on uh, the natural environment, sustainability. And so here, there's some, they're saying stop capitalism. So we have these examples just in the news in the last week or two of, business leaders that have done things that are unethical, or at least society perceives them to be that way. So here's what we see a lot, a lot less of, but that in the media at least, but actually happens quite a bit. So as part of the, the Center for Positive Organizations, we have a, a consortium. So we have a group of companies that's growing, and that group of companies um, all sort of subscribe to this idea of trying to uh, better society in some way through their organization, whether it be through their employees and or the broader impact they're having on society. And uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples. So Fred Keller is the CEO of Cascade Engineering. Um, they, their company does a lot. Fred's a, a really an amazing leader. We had him just come here and speak to our, our new undergraduate class. Uh, he was our opening lecture. And so they do things like have, one example would be uh, for people who have been in jail for, uh, convicted of a felony, they try to hire those people um, and help them in their careers because it's very hard to find a job afterwards. We've had a lot of success with that. Um, Jessica Amortigue, who uh, has done some, uh, she works at VMware, and she's actually done a lot with some stuff that, that Jane Dutton's helped develop around job crafting. She has a blog for Fast Company. She is really focused on how do you create a meaningful work environment the idea we're spending most of our time, most of our waking hours at work. And so she's trying to create a great experience there. And one last example is Chris Murchison uh, from Hope Lab. And they have a set of core values at Hope Lab. What he does every day is try to implement those core values in their various practices. Uh, and so things like having joy at work, uh, having respect, um, innovation, whatever their core values are, he's responsible for implementing those. So these are on a lower profile scale, and we tend to hear, not hear about those as much in the media, yet they really do exist. And so that's what I want us to think about a little bit more. What, what are these attributes of, of ethical leaders? So maybe we could start off by just having you kind of turn to the person next to you and think about this a little bit more. Think about someone in your own life uh, that you would describe to be an ethical leader. So why, why do you Think of this person as an ethical role model for you. Uh, what is it about him or her, either his or her personal qualities or behaviors that you really look up to this person and try to emulate them in some way? All right, so I know we have a range across students and faculty, and so whatever kind of the, the person that fits best for you and your position, go ahead and share that. Take a minute or two, share that with the person next to you.
All right, take 30 seconds more and wrap up. All right, so let's, let's come back together. Any, anybody feel comfortable sharing your story? I'm sure we've got some hands out there. Who's got an example for us? Yeah, you're, look, they're pointing. Look at that. Like, yeah, pointing to each other. All right, give, give us one of these. Uh, okay, I want to talk about one of my former boss. She's a really kind person, nice person. She really care about um, uh, our members. I was I was in the training department, and one of our uh, the a member, one of my colleague, want to quit and join another company. And then my boss just um, she was really concerned about about uh, my colleague and said, if it's really good for your career, and then I will support you. Right. I think she's really an ethical leader. Because really focused on the individual needs of the per, of the, her employee. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's right. Are you going to do you make her do it? Yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> um, so I was just telling Kevin about my father-in-law, who I've um, grown great respect for as a business owner and leader. Uh, he was a physician and had a private practice for 35, 40 years. And what I appreciated so much about that was he... Um, spent a lot of emphasis, obviously taking care of his patients, but um, a great deal spent on his employees and at all levels. So his assistants re down to the receptionist, everyone in the company or his practice understood the role that they played and that they mattered. Uh, it wasn't, he didn't focus his business on himself. He took great care in, in what their needs were and making sure they were happy and felt an important part of his team. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot about just other focused and not worried so much about status, but trying to treat everyone in the organization kind of in a respectful manner, taking individual needs into account. All right, so we've got a couple of these examples. What I want to do is get us to think a little bit more about what we might call a more positive approach to thinking about ethics, consistent with our, our book around how to be a positive leader. Because I think the types of examples we tend to think of when, when we think about ethics, we often tend to think of unethical behaviors that... So I want to try to shift gears a little bit. Um, a few of my core beliefs around this, what does this mean to take a positive approach? And then we'll see how we're doing on time here, but maybe give you at least a few minutes to do some type of audit, some type of analysis of your own kind of daily work life, whether it be as a student or, or as an employee. All right, so in a positive approach to ethics, let me ask you this one. So we've got two different bars. If you're thinking, what's the, what's the bar that society has set for us around ethics? And when I say ethics, I'm, I'm using this loosely. So around, in general, engaging in behaviors that are uh, generally accepted as, uh, so unethical actions would be things like lying or stealing or cheating or hurting someone. Positive actions would be things like helping, collaborating, coordinating with others, those types of behaviors. So what do you think when it comes to ethics? Do you think that we have a high bar in society or a low bar? What's, what's your reaction? Huh, Kim? Uh, I would say, for the most part, a low bar, but it's very uneven. Uh, the bar? Yes. <laughs> that is, in some cases, we're very rigid, and in some cases, anything goes. Okay. So it, de it depends on the actual actions, or I'm trying to understand when it, when it varies. In general, you're saying it's pretty low, though. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'm willing to go to the mat to uh, defend what I'm about to say. But um, I think for the most part, uh, in, our, in our particular society, you can get away with a lot, and people don't care much. It's, well, you know, it's your own style. Uh, except in certain instances where the bar is pretty rigid and pretty stable. You don't violate some things, like smacking your girlfriend, you know, that's an example. 
So it could be the position you're in, and it could be just the severity of the behavior that make it so that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any, any other thoughts? What's your, let me just get a show of hand. In general, would you say pretty high bar in society? Uh, pretty low bar in society. You guys aren't speaking up, but you're all saying low bar. All right, so what, what, do, we, what do we say? When, so these are things that we would say, the like types of behaviors that you are not supposed to engage in, right? So we call them prohibitions. So we're not supposed to break the law, we're not supposed to steal, or cheat, or lie, or physically harm other people. These are pretty well accepted behaviors that, that almost you could find a, a little, an example here or there where it might not be as bad, but in general, these are things that we, we feel like we, uh, behaviors we should not engage in. If you engage in those behaviors, I think to Kim's point, oftentimes people are quite punitive about it. Let's take the other side about good behaviors or pro-social behaviors, things to do, things we call, think about, we might call prescriptions. So, you know, giving someone a pat on the back, boosting their self-esteem, being a good mentor, listening to other people, uh, being a helping hand when they need assistance, cheering other people on, blowing the whistle if there's some type of unethical behavior, right? So sometimes people don't code these behaviors as ethical behaviors, but in many ways, they tie into many of our core values. And so how do we think about these as part of our bigger set of what it means to be a, an ethical leader? Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we focus both on that, that bad side, the sort of all those unethical actions, and on this more positive or pro-social side? What, is the, what does that pro-social side get you? How, how do employees respond uh, with the kind of a more pro-social orientation towards leadership. What do you think, Liz? Because then, because then people have some idea of what to do versus just what not to do. So it's a more active state versus sort of looking at a list of behaviors that you ought not to passively do and sit there. Okay. What, what's, in, what's inspiring to you, the leader who is selfless or the leader who tries to do no bad, do no wrong? Well, sure, the leader who is, who is selfless. Um, of course, a combination of both is preferred. Yeah. Selflessly you, lying probably isn't a... That's not as good. Okay. That's right. So you don't get to be selfless and then also do bad things. But in general, when people are more inspired, it's more on this, this pro-social or prescription side. And we have a lot of research on this, too. When, uh, when individuals tend to engage in these more prescriptions, these pro-social helpful behaviors, we, th we see things like increased performance, people stay at companies longer, uh, better recruitment efforts, more motivated, more engagement, and then we see less counterproductive behavior too. So people stay at organizations longer, for example. And so here's one way to think about it. You could think about it as an organizational level if you're in a company now. If you're in a student, you could think about your own kind of moral code. But where, where do you draw the line as you think about this continuum? What we'd say compliance, so you can't break the law. All of us would, you know, we might speed a little bit sometimes, but most of us would say, all right, we can't break the law. Next one, prohibition avoidance. Um, so we're not unethical, even if it's legal. So you could think of an example where you might do something that you technically would not get in any legal trouble, but it's probably not right, the right thing to do. What about temptation resistance? So you're not unethical, even if there are high incentives. So nobody's watching what you're doing. There's a really a low penalty. It, there's a, a very, uh, it's very unlikely that you'd be caught for the behavior, but you decide that you won't engage in it. And the last one is this sort of embracement of prescriptions. Um, so do pro-social behaviors that help other people. Where, where do you draw the line personally when you're thinking about who you want to interact with, uh, whether it be at work and school? Do, you, do they have to go all the way to the green for you to embrace them? What, where do you draw the line? Uh -huh, Jane? I would say that so, um, being existing as an employee in two very different departments, mm -hmm. one in LSNA and one in the business school, I mean, I draw the line depending on the context. Ah. I wish I were not, but I notice that in some contexts the green light is a lot brighter. And so the prescription embracing is much more vivid. And in others where you're sort of left on your own, I might strike. I don't think I'd go down to red, but I might be 
Do you think that your own standard for your evaluating your own behavior changes across those or just your expectations of, of others? No, I would say both. Uh, so if you're in a place that tends to not be as helpful, you don't really feel the same pressure to always do that too. Right. Yeah. Other, I thought I might have seen a hand over here. How, how, do you, how do you determine where you draw that line then? I guess this is, can be partly rhetorical, but how do you know if you're going to focus on, I think most of companies would always be at this kind of uh, not breaking the law, but as we move further this way, could, sometimes we talk about this as, as moralization, of moralizing life. Could you take behaviors that you've traditionally not seen as being within the ethical domain and start to think of your everyday behavior? So for my MBA students, for example, I have them keep track of every ethical decision they make for 24 hours. Then we come back together and we talk about what that was like. And so many of the behaviors that they've traditionally thought of as just, you know, Maybe they talked to a, a friend who was in need or something like that. They didn't code that as being an ethical behavior, but in fact it is. And they started to see, wow, every decision I make throughout my life has this sort of moral component to it. Um, and so it was fascinating for me because I thought they would come up with like lists of, I don't know, an infinite amount, a hundred things. It's from the time you wake up in the morning to like what product you buy and um, kind of how much water you're using and everything. But when I asked students in the class about how many ethical decisions do you make a day, what do you think it was? What's that? Three to five. Yeah. Chris said three to five. It's somewhere around there. I think we often think of these bigger things as ethical decisions, not these kind of day-to-day -day ones. And, and that's the kind of approach that gets you towards this more positive path of the green. Of course, nobody's perfect. You don't want to drive yourself crazy with it. So that, that can you get, kind of move yourself a little bit more towards in that direction? So let me do, talk about a few beliefs. I want to make sure we have time for the, okay, we're good, um, about this positive approach. So I mentioned these unethical and pro-social behaviors. Sometimes I'll get kind of pushback or you'll get pushback in, in organizations about why should we have ethics training or ethics is so ambiguous and, and so we could have like a three-hour conversation about if this or that behavior was ethical or unethical. But it turns out we actually have pretty high agreement on this. I've surveyed over a, a thousand students and executives and people are in pretty high agreement about which behaviors are acceptable and which ones are not. Uh, and so we can definitely split hairs and you can find times where lying was okay because you spared somebody else's feelings. But for the most part, we have pretty high agreement on this. So over time, I've, I used to think that ethical issues were a lot more gray and many of them are very gray. What I see from you know, working with executives and with students is that they often make very black and white behaviors seem more gray, oftentimes for some type of self-interested reason. And so uh, we have pretty high agreement there. Second belief, high agreement on values that matter most to people. So I can draw on my colleague uh, Wayne Baker's work about American values. So he's done a lot of research. He has this book out, United America, that says, well, what are the core values of the US? Well, we tend to think it's really split. We have red states and blue states. We don't really get along. We see the world differently. That's not what he finds. He finds that there are a, a set of core values that are pretty consistent across most Americans. Things like respect, respect freedom, security, opportunity, fairness. It's, it's, not, it's not that uh, controversial. There's research in the area in psychology about certain themes that come up that most people agree with. Issues around care, fairness, loyalty. You're seeing some of the similarities. And then cross-cultural research. So you look at all of the world's major religions, and say, is there anything consistent? Because it sure feels like we have problems in the Middle East and we have problems all over the world with religions not getting along. And it's been the basis of many wars. And then you look and you say, all right, at the root of pretty much every one of the world's major religions are a similar set of virtues. Things like courage, justice, humanity, temperance, wisdom, and transcendence. So I'm trying to paint this picture that the world maybe is a little bit less gray than we tend to think about it. The third one is high agreement on the desire to act in an ethical manner um, and to, to so see yourself that way and have other people see you that way. So I'll just raise your hand if it, it matters to you to be a, a good writer. That would be important to you. Okay. Many hands. Um, raise your hand if it would be important for you to be good at math. All right. A few less, but why not? Um, 
Raise your hand if it matters, if you feel like you're a good person. There's, like, there's no variance on that one, right? Do you know what we call people who don't care? Sociopaths, exactly. It's a tiny, tiny percentage of the population. But you can see, perhaps we've evolved in some way for this to be something that, that, that everyone cares about. Uh, we care about how we see ourselves, and we care about how others see us. Let me give you a, a, an example here. Anybody know the story, the biblical story of the Good Samaritan? When was that? Can you, can you give me the short version? <laughs> you get the mic. He was in our uh, BA 200 class in here a few, a few hours ago, so he's getting extra, extra duty here. Go for it. Uh, so basically there's two warring cities, and one guy comes out of the one they're always fighting, which is common in the Old Testament, and he gets robbed and beaten, and he's on the side of the road, like, practically dying. And multiple people from his own city walk by, and they're just kind of too busy. One's like a politician. One's a businessman. They're just, you know, oh, I got too much going on today. I'll go. And then one person from the, the enemy city comes by, uh, sees him, picks him up, takes him back to his city. So, like, risks his life to take him back, get cared for, and, like, recover. So it's just kind of, like seeing that these people that were part of his country didn't take the time to care for him when this stranger who was technically his enemy did. Right. So, so this, the, the context of this study here, and there's, there's a reason I'm pointing this out, the context of this study is that they looked at a bunch of seminary students. This was actually uh, about a, a classic study maybe 30 or 40 years ago. So these are seminary students at Princeton. And they were going to give a talk on campus, across campus, about this Good Samaritan parable. So they were going to go talk to a bunch of students about this one. And being like good scientists who like to rile things up, uh, they created some type of manipulation on Princeton's campus. So there were two different versions. Some of those students, oh, I should say, as they walked across campus, there was someone who was like planted there who was writhing in pain on the ground. Oh, help me, help me. Something very similar to this person who was uh, in trouble, um, who needed the help from the Good Samaritan. Right, so that's the context. And then the only thing that was varied was how much time these seminary students had to get from point A to point B. And so in one, they had half an hour. They had plenty of time to get across campus to get there. Another one, they said, we're getting started in like five minutes. We really need you to get across campus. As a reminder, they're going to give a talk about the Good Samaritan parable. So what do you think, what percentage of the people who were not in a hurry stopped? Guesses? What, 80? 80? Any other guesses? 20? Depends. We're just getting your views of human nature right now. That's it. So about 60 percentage, 60 percent of, of people who were not in a hurry, these seminary students, stopped. Um, what about the percentage that were in a hurry? What's that? 20? 10. 10. Ah, Diane, you got it. 10% uh, stopped. So how do, you, how do you make sense of that? Do you think the seminary students were, uh, you know, just not as good a people? A lot of rationalization going on there. Yeah, I, I think it's a function of us really being impacted by the environment that we're in, right? So... I think we can make the case. These are probably pretty good people. Just dedicating their life, go to seminary. It's not 100%, but probably a pretty good pool of people. Um, and so what I want to, this fourth belief is really about the context we're in. So you think about being an ethical leader, uh, the, the environment that we're creating is huge. So we could, as leaders, we can make people feel like they're really busy and have to get something done. And if it doesn't get done by Friday, then forget it. We can put that type of pressure on someone. And, and we're, we kind of know how they're going to act. Um, so we have a tendency to believe that these bad apples do bad things and good eggs do good things. It's probably part of the resistance around ethics education at a lot of business schools, which is like, what can you really do because people come to the situation with their values or not? Uh, but we actually find the context others are in makes this huge impact on how they actually behave. Um, the last belief here is it's like a metaphor that I like. I don't know if you've had this experience. Uh, you are, uh, you've like made up your mind, maybe it's, maybe it's like New Year's resolution, whatever it is, you've made up your mind, you're going to like change some of your uh, habits. So you say, I'm going to the gym in the morning. You set your alarm, the first time that you try to go to the gym, is it easy or hard? 
It's very hard. It's really hard. And then you have that conversation and you, with yourself. You do like two or three snoozes. You may get up. But if you find a way to get up, it's a little bit easier the next day, the next day. And then you're in some type of a rhythm over a few weeks. Um, similarly, maybe you've said, okay, I'm going to eat a little bit better. And when we go out to eat, I really, I'm wa watching football, I really want the burgers and fries. Um, I'm getting a salad. I'm getting the chicken salad, that's what I'm doing. I swear I'm not speaking from personal experience. <laughs> Can you hear this? Um, and so, uh, it's pretty hard to do that, you know, when you first go out. And then you do it a few times and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I can go out to eat. I can get a salad. You know, life will go on. Well, we tend to use this metaphor around health-related things a lot, but not around ethics. And I think it's very similar. Uh, the idea that we have lots of temptation in our lives in different ways, and that you can think of that as a muscle, as something that you can actually build up. And uh, here's an example from Ben Franklin. You may or may not want to go this far. But Ben Franklin uh, lived a life pursuing what he called moral perfection. So he said, these are my 13 core virtues, which may or may not overlap with ones that you would have. This is his set. And he actually kept track every day of how he was doing. So he had some scoring sheet over here, too. There are all the virtues. Keep track. How is he doing each day? What's your reaction to that? Is that like, is that like mad, madness sucking the fun out of life? Or is that a great way to kind of make sure you're in line with your values? What do you think? Is that, is that doable? You're making a funny face. Uh, it's kind of contrary to some of the things I said about Benjamin Franklin. Ah, <laughs> this might have been after the fact, after some of those bad behaviors. <laughs> what do you think? Yep. Actually, in our research on virtuous, yeah. No, there's no such thing as a single virtue operating in independently by itself. If you are forgiving, you are also compassionate. If mm. you are loving, you are also generous, and so on. So my expectation is that these things will work in clumps, clusters. I don't know what the clusters are, but so far they're empirically connected. Interesting. So you may not be high in on one and low on another, some of them will cluster together and be similar. So I, I use this not as maybe a literal way, but as an idea of how do we gain some level of awareness about our behaviors, how do we align that with our values, and because in our typical day, we just kind of go through our day quite quickly. Um, so this is one approach for thinking about this. And so here's the takeaway for me, um, that I would say humans have evolved to value morality both not doing bad things and also doing good things, helping cooperative behaviors. Um, but we're also social animals and we're highly influenced by the environment we're, we're in. Um, and that's why leaders matter so much. Leaders are the ones that are most likely to, to shape the context that we're in. Um, and it's not something that's easy. So sometimes we have this discussion in some of my classes about is it easy or hard to be an ethical person, a good person? And it's kind of across the board, people's reactions initially. Uh, but as we think about it a little bit more, you can see how challenging that is across your day. All right, so we've got a, we've got a few minutes here. This is perfect. Um, could we go ahead and pass those out? Thanks, Angie. So I want you to just think a little bit about your day with the idea of uh, gaining some level of awareness of the types of behaviors you, you engage in. We're not going to get a lot of time with this, so you might get five or six minutes. Uh, and if you want to work on it later, do that. But I just want to seed this idea. I want you to think about your actions over the past couple of weeks. Uh, again, if you're employed, think about your work context. If you're a student, think about your student-related experiences. And I want you to think about behaviors that you've engaged in um, that are just your own actions and other actions where you're actually trying to influence someone else to behave in a better way. Uh, so we're talking about avoiding unethical behavior and engaging in, in pro-social behavior. I'll give you an example. Just look up for one sec. You can fill this in. These are, I'll, I'll leave this up here just for example's sake. Um, but like one could be uh, my own behavior, avoiding unethical behavior. So as a, as a scholar, um, only reporting accurate results in a research article, heavy temptation to publish, um, but you have to make sure that the results that you're presenting are, are accurate and, and appropriate. And so. I put a few different examples there. So go ahead and try to, to fill that out on your own. And then the last part is think about what tools or practices or mantras do you use. So some people say, like, uh, if this ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, uh, would I feel okay about it? I mean, but 
Everyone has their, if my kid knew this, how would I feel? But what would be the mantra that you would use? All right, so maybe let's go five or six minutes to give a shot with that. <laughs> She's just, just thinking about harming people she doesn't want to throw. This is a task that could take a while, but just take maybe one or two more minutes to wrap up. All right, let's, let's come back together. I realize most of you are still writing a little bit. You know you're being photographed while you're writing? Those, those were some good shots. <laughs> um, so I, I did this exercise for just a couple of reasons. Um, one is as you fill that out and you start to see certain boxes that maybe uh, some boxes are easier to fill in than others. And so you can start to see, well, maybe I do a really good job of kind of being a good person on my own but I don't really make a lot of efforts to influence other people in a good way. That, that might be something that you would notice. You might notice I'm pretty good about making sure I don't do anything bad and making sure my, you know, my team doesn't do anything bad. I don't know, do I really emphasize kind of going above and beyond that much? Do I try to create a culture where that's the case among my employees or, or my peers? Uh, let, let's talk about this for just a, a couple of minutes. What, what types of things work for you, knowing that you're busy, we have a lot going on in, in our lives, um, things that you kind of do, even if it's a, a photo or, or whatever it is that helps kind of keep you centered around on your core values? Uh -huh. um, well, one thing that I do try to make a practice of is that when – I'm in a work setting and we're having a lot of trouble choosing between a couple of different alternatives. Usually there are lots of pros and cons. And so if I'm in a meeting with somebody and we're sort of doing a lot of going back and forth, I try to have that be a signal to remind me 
to say, okay, let's take a step back and just think about values for a moment and mm. see if that helps clarify the situation. And often that does tip the balance. It, like the values that you've agreed upon would be the... Right. Yeah, right. that would Our guide you. Values as an organization. Yeah, that's great. Other things you do either at an individual level or an organizational level. On my phone, I have yeah. really good things. So every time I check the time, if the email comes through, I see that. Oh. My phone. It's very hard. To, so I have on my phone, it says do good things. And so it just <laughs> constantly comes up. You know, I look at it and it reminds me over and over. Yeah. It's hard to get rid of, though. It feels like I'm doing a bad thing by getting rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, that's right. You can, you can put your kids over do good things. That's okay. Well, there's actually a, a, a media, there's going to be, what is it, Chris, the, like a positive technology conference here on campus, which is like really focused on various types of apps and things that can remind you on a, on a daily basis. Did you have something, Brian? Or just, did you have something too? No? Uh-huh, Jane? So Ben Zander, for anybody who's read his book, The Art of Possibility, uh -huh. um, as director of the Philharmonic, he always tells his performers to think about yourself as a cont contribution uh -huh. as opposed to thinking about yourself as a performer. And I find that is really helpful in getting me to think about the pro-social side. So be a contribution would be what Ben Zander would uh -huh. say. So instead of like, I'm performing, how well am I doing? Are you, are you kind of helping the collective? Yeah, that's great. Um, so I just encourage the, you to think about, too, what are the types of things in your own life that work around that um, to, to surround yourself with those types of artifacts. Again, whether they be people that are close to you or sayings, it's kind of – sometimes I'll have the students ask me, they want, like, the cheat sheet. It's such a shock for our, our MBA students. They want, like, three takeaways that give you the answer um, to the meaning of life. Um, and, it, and, and so they want to say, like, which of those things should I do? And ultimately, it ends up being very different for, for different people. But the notion that having practices and mantras that, that fit yourself, so that does tend to work well. Um, so let me, I still give you takeaways anyway, just because I've been trained to do it. Um, but I would say, to, to the point early on that we see all these bad examples, and then I have to ask you about good examples, they're hard to find. Um, I think that's a function of our, our media more than what's actually happening. We have amazing examples of leaders doing uh, fabulous things in organizations. Uh, I would also say a, a positive view has a, a, a pretty positive orientation towards people. And there's a lot of science that backs this up. People care about being good people. They want to see themselves that way. They want others to see them that way. Uh, and uh, their core values are really important to them. Um, it's important to have these practices and rituals, so that's what we were talking about just now. I mentioned this idea of moralizing. So it's a, it's a tedious process to do it, but if you can go through your day and start to think more about what are these sort of mundane decisions that I'm making, but that actually have some type of moral implication to them, you can start to go a little bit more down that path of being kind of uh, acting more in line with your values. Um, and the last one is that a leader's job is to create the right type of environment, an environment that's focused not just on avoiding bad behavior, which is, tends to be what we hear about a lot in the news, but also how you would promote pro-social positive behaviors. Uh, so let me give a couple of thank yous, and then we'll, we'll wrap up, and then we can head out for a reception. So a big thanks to, to Jane and Gretchen for uh, Jane for doing this, and also for spearheading uh, this book. And did you know that like faculty members aren't always very good at being on time? It happens sometimes. Um, so they were very, they were great and patient with us. Uh, Angie, I, I found a photo of you. She was not happy about that. But, I got a, but Angie and Janelle, can you stand up? Is, is Janelle still here? She's, she's right out there. Um, and we'll do a, a applause at the end. Um, but amazing uh, getting all of this set up. Um, Paul, Diane, I couldn't find you on the web. Where are you? <laughs> you're not there. I'm sure you're somewhere. But thank you guys very much for... Uh, for making this happen. Um, and then, of course, to all you on a, on a late Monday afternoon for coming out. I hope that you will, uh, you know, uh, contact me if you have any types of questions in the future. And we got not that food, but we have food <laughs> that's out there. Um, so could we give a round of applause to everyone who helped make this happen, too?
and um, symbols of the, that sort of help to call forth the best in people. So um, you here is our artifact, an expression of our gratitude. It has the representation of a positive spiral, okay. uh, which is an image I think that we talk about a lot. So thank you, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.